Welcome, everybody. This is the press conference of the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Prior to the film's introduction, uh, we have asked the press to come. We have, uh, in fact, uh, invited uh, dozens and dozens of local press uh, from the Los Angeles area. I'm Richard Gage, AIA founder and CEO of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. I'm producer and director of tonight's film, the final edition of 9-11, Explosive Evidence, Experts Speak Out. I'm quite proud to be accompanied tonight also by veteran actors, uh, former Screen Actors Guild president, Mr. Ed Asner. Ed, would you stand? Ed has uh, courageously supported us for years and who has uh, also an important message for us tonight. We also have seasoned actor John Hurd, who has appeared in Cutter's Way, Home Alone, and Big. John, would you stand and say hi? Thank you, gentlemen. Well, in this milestone documentary, more than 40 experts in the fields of architecture, fire protection engineering, structural engineering, chemistry, physics, and controlled demolition highlight the irrefutable evidence that has troubled them and should trouble all of us about the explosive destruction of the World Trade Center Twin Towers and the lesser known World Trade Center Building 7 on September 11, 2001. We'll also show you nine experts in the human mind who will help us understand the mental and emotional dynamics that, for so many of us, have become obstacles to our rational evaluation of this scientific forensic evidence. We are a nonpartisan educational organization. Our mission is about a new independent investigation of the destruction of the three World Trade Center high-rises on 9-11. We have more than 1,700 architects and engineers now who have joined us, who are calling for such an investigation. More than 14,000 additional concerned citizens have signed our petition, many of them with expertise in the related fields. What's the evidence that has convinced these professionals to put their reputations, and in many cases, their careers on the line? The features of the destruction of the Twin Towers and Building 7 do not fit the features that would, we would expect from the destruction by fire. First, there was the total destruction of three steel frame skyscrapers on one day. The third building, World Trade Center 7, was destroyed and it wasn't even hit by an airplane. The government's report blames this complete freefall destruction on normal office fires. <laughs> the government agency tasked with explaining this to the American people was pressured publicly into embarrassment from a high school physics teacher, David Chandler, into changing its draft report to admit that the building came down without resistance from 80 of its columns on each of eight floors, but they still did not see fit to explain it. The symmetrical freefall destruction of World Trade Center 7 appears exactly like a controlled demolition, like the old hotels in Las Vegas. It comes down smoothly, symmetrically, at freefall acceleration. We've seen this before, all of us. The debris piles underneath World Trade Center 7 are riddled with molten metal. Molten iron, it turns out to be, which requires heat far in excess of normal office fires, in fact, far in excess of what jet fuel can create as well. Over 400 structural steel connections had to fail every second in order for this building to come down in the manner that it did, free fall and symmetrically. FEMA's Appendix C in their Building Performance Assessment Report documents the hot temperature corrosion of the steel looking like Swiss cheese. And yet, NIST rejected this in the final report, and we don't know about it today, along with much of the other evidence, including that from the Twin Towers, where we're told we had a gravitational collapse due to the jet plane impacts and the fires resulting therefrom, causing the 
failure of structural steel members and a gravitational collapse all the way down to the ground. But this is not what we see. What we see is the top portion above the point of jet plane impacts telescoping in on itself in what can only be described as a miniature controlled demolition. It's, it's falling almost at free fall acceleration, straight down suddenly, smoothly, almost symmetrically. And after that, what we see is not a pancaking collapse, as has been described, but the lateral projection of four-ton perimeter wall units at 600 feet landing that far away, uh, being propelled at 70 miles an hour. What we don't see is a pile of floors, 110 in each of the Twin Towers. What we see instead is a two-story pile of core columns, perimeter columns. What we'll also see tonight is the pulverization of 90,000 tons of concrete in mid-air to a fine powder, which is documented as the particle size of talcum powder. This is rather extraordinary in and of itself, landing in a three square mile about lower Manhattan. We also have in, the, in this dust the evidence of a very high-tech incendiary called superthermite or nanothermite. These are small red-gray chips documented by a small team of scientists from all around the world. In these chips, which are about a sixteenth of an inch long, most of them found in all the dust samples they collected, are extremely small particles of iron oxide and aluminum powder that are a thousand times smaller than the diameter of a human hair, even one of mine, if they can be found. <laughs> these particles are nano-engineered from the atom scale up, an extremely sophisticated science and manufacturing process that's only found in the most advanced defense contracting laboratories. It should not be found in all the World Trade Center dust samples, nor should the byproduct of these ignited nanothermite chips, the byproduct being billions of iron microspheres the diameter of about a human hair themselves. These are requiring over 2800 degrees temperature in order to even create, to melt iron. This is not available in the temperatures associated with office fires or jet fuel either. So we have some serious problems with the official story. What I'm asking the press tonight is, will you report it? When your chief editor censors your story, will you go to bat for the truth? Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. We at Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth have been spoon-feeding you the evidence of the story of the crime of the century for six years now. Shame on you for your part in its cover-up. Your complicity by silence is criminal in and of itself. Yeah. It's not hard to find outrageous, undisputed examples of media bias, self-censorship, and uncritical service to the system of mainstream media that you serve. Its iconic mouthpiece, William Hurst, back in the turn of the 20th century, boasted, you bring me the pictures and I'll bring you the war. And he did, the Spanish-American War. The Media Monopoly by Ben Bagdikian tells the story of ever greater concentration of ownership in the corporate media with just a tiny handful of executives making decisions in boardrooms about what you and I are going to hear about and how we will hear it spun, as well as what we will never hear about. An annual collection of the most censored stories is available in Project Censored. For more than 25 years, they've been reporting the most censored subjects in the mainstream media. Christina Borgeson's brilliant collection, Into the Buzzsaw, leading journalists exposed the myth of a free press, which came out in 2004. Operation Mockingbird, the CIA's deliberate, systematic infiltration of the mainstream media, is an admitted fact now. The list goes on and on. We know 
and we are calling you to accountability. Do they really not teach you this history in journalism school? Or are so many of you really so happy to be used to make a buck? How many of you are ignorant, lazy, ultimately incompetent? How many of you are knowingly complicit? To coin a phrase, the truth is out there. The truth about the history of the media in the United States and the truth about 9-11. We are accustomed ourselves to being called conspiracy theorists in the worst sense of the term, even though what we're talking about and presenting and what you'll see tonight is anything but that. It's scientific forensic evidence. What we're not used to and can hardly believe is that a serious accomplished producer would respond to our request for coverage. Robert Anderson from 60 Minutes recently did that by saying, it's too far out there. It's not the kind of stuff we do. This is after indicating initial interest in the project upon prompting from a member of our staff. Is he serious? What part of what we say was he talking about? The part about Newton's laws, which say that an object can do no work while it's in free fall, such as World Trade Center 7, doing the work of crushing all 87 steel support columns evenly while coming down in free fall. Or maybe the office fire is burning 1,000 degrees too cold to produce the billions of iron microspheres found in the World Trade Center dust. These undeniable facts are too far out there for this responsible member of the media establishment. Maybe he was referring to the highly engineered energetic materials that produce molten iron when ignited. The same is found in the World Trade Center dust. Like the Christian mullahs who persecuted Galileo over 400 years ago, today's media refuse to look through the telescope at the science of 9-11. Or in this case, the microscope. In a 2002 BBC interview, veteran CBS reporter and anchorman Dan Rather, who initially acknowledged that World Trade Center 7's destruction looked like it was blown up with dynamite, both admitted and partly explained why so many journalists censor themselves. There was a time in South Africa, he says, that people would put flaming tires around people's necks if they dissented. And in some ways, the fear is that you'll be necklaced here. You'll have a flaming tire of lack of patriotism put around your neck. Now it is that fear that keeps journalists from asking the toughest questions. Are you that kind of journalist? Your track record on 9-11 betrays your answer. If your boss, your peers, or some of your audience decides you are unpatriotic, does that make it true? If you had to take a pay cut in order to do the right thing at work, would you do it? We all have families to support. So did the guards at the Nazi death camps. Good luck with that argument. Let me speak from personal experience. I wasn't doing anything wrong when, as an architect, I designed buildings for a living. Nonetheless, I took a substantial pay cut to do the work that I do now. And I work twice as hard as I ever did. And you know what? I'm a lot happier. I have a passion for what I do just about every minute of the day. You might find that you don't have to sacrifice as much as you think you do to start doing the right thing about 9-11 as a journalist. Many of you went into journalism because you wanted to make a difference. You wanted to make the world a better place. And then reality set in. Many of you gave up on your dreams. Some of you, who are presumably not here tonight, quit the profession in order to pursue your dreams, to find a career that you could pursue with integrity. Some of you, maybe even some of you who are here with us today, are on the verge of making that decision to leave the profession because you see the corruption, the unacknowledged daily lives, and it makes you sick, as it does the rest of us. How about making a difference on your way out? How about doing whatever it would take to get an accurate, deep, in-context story about 9-11 truth out there? And if they fire you for it, so be it. You're not likely to become homeless. There are more and more independent, web-based, or conventional media outlets that Americans are trusting and turning to. 
How many of you fall into that category tonight yeah. in the media? Woo! Thank you. You're doing your job. Many journalists, even those who gave us the cold shoulder and or play dumb, such as Matt Taibbi, Chris Hedges, Amy Goodman, obviously have a conscience and have reported important stories with integrity. But I've gotten quite a rude awakening with journalists, actually, as it's actually practiced, uh, since founding Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, uh, particularly with the BBC and National Geographic, owned, by the way, by Fox News, who's interviewed myself, David Ray Griffin, Stephen Jones, and several other 9-11 Truth spokespersons. Based on past experience, we took every precaution to present the evidence in a way that could not be spun. Yet they managed to fail to meet even our lowest expectations. They completely censored that evidence that I sat there and gave them point after point with references to mainstream stories and peer-reviewed scientific articles. The high points of the mainstream media's 9-11 lies include PBS, How the Towers Fell, BBC, Conspiracy Files, Popular Mechanics Book, which is a ridiculous collection of straw man arguments, owned and operated, by the way, by Rupert Murdoch, the National Geographic Channel, 9-11 Science and Conspiracy, multiple history channel shows as well. Traitors! It's not <laughs> difficult to find our devastating rebuttals to these so-called uh, coverages of the 9-11 evidence. Some in the media are so desperate to crawl back into your comforting box, it may not have occurred to you that we had a professional response to each of these propaganda hit pieces. Yet you habitually cite them as if these poorly crafted deceptions actually take care of the problem. Pour yourself a cup of courage, or whatever it takes for you, fire up your browser, open your eyes, we will help you. The family members of the victims lost on 9-11 started the 9-11 Truth Movement 10 years ago. We are here to support them. And you will hear them supporting us in this film. Justice delayed is justice denied. The train of justice is leaving the station. You are facing a critical moral choice right here and right now. Whether you want it or not, for your own good as well as for the billions of people on this planet whose lives have been irrevocably damaged by the myth of 9-11, what you are going to do about this issue when you go into work tomorrow, what are you going to do when you go into work tomorrow or the next day and the next day? If even just one ember of this noble fire that so many of you started with still burns in your belly, now is the time to let it out, to let it have its way with you and your life. Your country needs you to show up, and we've made it as easy as we can. We have the 9-11 Investigator Broadsheet newspaper right here on our website and right outside where you can pick one up on the way out. It's referenced in hard copy versions. We've got as many technical articles as you can read. We've got tonight's DVD of 9-11 Explosive Evidence Experts Speak Out with 43 technical and building professionals ready to support you and back you up. The evidence is there on the top menu of our website as well. Many of those articles have been out for years. They are news to the hundreds of thousands of readers you could have if you gave this information the exposure that it deserves. Those of you who are with the media and are still here, thank you for bearing up. I truly appreciate it and respect you for it. But you know as well as I do, if you're honest with yourself, that the hard work you're being called to do here has only just begun. Godspeed to you as you get started with it. Now I'd like to introduce somebody very special who is no stranger to media censorship, Mr. Ed Asner. How the hell am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> I 
scientific facts concerning 9-11. But may I point out to you, I don't know what the latest figures are, but good God, let us look at the percentile in this country who believe in the scientific creation of the world and man. And then let's look at those who claim or call themselves creationists. And I'm sure that the vast majority will fall into the line of creationism, defying the science that is around them in every area, in every walk of life. We deny science in this country unless it provides us with war tools. So, the war tool. Can you imagine? I do a lot of traveling lately doing a one-man show. I go to a lot of airports, see a lot of things. I see the whole phalanx of employees of the government at work, frisking you, putting you through the scanners, this, that, that. You, you mean to tell me in all this world <clears throat> there isn't some dedicated terrorist who knows that he can strap on those explosives if he wants to and go to the airport and find a particular area in the airport that probably contains a hundred people and before he goes through security and plants himself in the middle of those hundred people and blows himself to bits I, why? Why? I, I, I think Air, uh, Transportation Safety Agency is a huge symbol of what our country has become. We have become a uh, democratic dictatorship. We are ruled, overruled, guided constantly, and we are led, and more and more, refinements of that are taking place every day. You mean to say that there is no, no wonder, no curiosity about architects and engineers and all the scientific facts they come forward with? Where, where is it? This room should be filled, standing room only with journalists or with people who want to hear and see this film. Where are they? Where's the curiosity? Now, if architects and engineers had put out a flyer that said, come to the uh, music theater, three jobs will be offered. 
a warm place to defecate, uh, provision of non-tight shoes, and this place would be mobbed. And that's where America is. No tight shoes, a good shithole, and maybe three squares if you can find them. That's what we have to offer. Other than all of this, all of this wonderful scientific information, all of this wonderful scientific information is blah, blah, because the sheeple, the sheeple don't want to hear it, see it. I mean, to come across college-educated people and try to present some of the facts and figures of 9-11, it's ha-ha time. And it's, they look at you and they become emulating of the little plastic dogs in the back of a car window. And they shake their heads. <laughs> Not all of them, man. Enough of them. Enough of them. So, I don't have a lot of hope about this. I mean, we have been on a slow, long, trajectory of government creation of crises in this country. The Spanish American War was just one. The Tonkin, and, uh, uh, Panama, all, all of that. Iraq, for Christ's sake. How could the people not, not react to Iraq with the lies exposed there, even, even participated in by that journal of journals, the New York Times. But it was not to be. So 9-11 probably will never get its day in court, but we have to sacrifice ourselves on being looked at by the bobbleheads <laughs> and knowing that we have control of our heads, that we have control of the information and the truth that truth makes us free. And if you're ready for a tool that can bring us to such freedom as eloquently outlined by Ed, I would like to introduce our film tonight. Welcome, everybody, to this exciting occasion, the official premiere of the final edition of 9-11 Explosive Evidence, Experts Speak Out. Well, we've had quite a team of consultants, volunteers, who have put this film together in an effort that started over two and a half years ago with our co-director, Marty McGee, in Buffalo. We're also very grateful for our team members who have spent thousands of hours helping us to choose only the most accurate and clear statements of the evidence. We're especially grateful to the 9-11 victims' family members who encouraged us to interview them to get their message out. I want to especially thank our chief video editor, Francis Battaglia. Francis, would you stand up? You will have no idea how little sleep this man has gotten over the last six months particularly the last week. And also uh, with us, um, we have Mr. Uh, Chuck Smith, an incredible man who has uh, donated thousands of hours of his own time. He is our video team leader. Chuck, would you stand up? There he is. Chuck. And here with us tonight also is our one of our, our chief technical editor, Mr. Greg Roberts. Greg, would you, uh, you're already standing Greg. And Greg assisted Jim Hoffman in the development of the 911research.com website in 2003 that has become a staple for David Ray Griffin and many of the rest of us in the 911 truth movement. Greg is one of the co-authors of the peer-reviewed paper Active Thermitic Material Discovered in the Dust from the 911 World Trade Center Catastrophe, a paper whose startling findings are discussed in this film as well. He's also a leader of a legal team at AE 911 Truth legal team. Why do we have a legal team? Well, the pursuit of justice on behalf of the 9-11 victims' family members is a vital component of our mission. 
And we are indeed supported by the victim family members who started the 9-11 Truth Movement and who have encouraged us from the very beginning in 2006, who speak alongside us and even represent us in our call for a new investigation. High-rise architect Robert McCoy, also with us today, who stars in our film. Would you stand, Robert? <laughs> States right up front in 9-11 explosive evidence experts speak out. I don't want to get into conspiracy theories. What we really need to know is how those buildings came down. Let's deal right off the bat here with this term conspiracy theory. As many of you have already figured out, the term conspiracy theory is a loaded term designed to get you to stop thinking <laughs> about what we are saying, to stop thinking about the evidence that you'll see tonight and to get you instead to start imagining what's wrong with us personally. You see the problem? Our detractors would not be resorting to such tactics if they had good answers to the questions and the evidence that you'll see tonight. We always welcome sincere skeptics, but we admonish you, don't bite the finger, look to where it's pointing. All right. We will have a chance to talk after the film as well, giving you an opportunity to support us as well um, after the film. So let's get to it. I hope you enjoy the film. <laughs> 